question and yes, uh, both Gemma and I are here, so I'll start and then Gemma will continue. The topic of our presentation is uh, around the European Convention on Human Rights and the question of media uh, freedom. And Gemma will be doing the slides <laughs> very kindly. So um, our interest in this uh, uh, topic um, started very much um, with the realization of this kind of strange relationship that the uh, UK has had for a number of years with the European Convention on Human Rights. And um, obviously the convention was incorporated into British law after the Human Rights Act, uh, and it's coming into force in 2000, meaning that British courts actually have to uh, follow what the European Court of Human Rights says. Uh, what is interesting is that um, since 2001, there's been around 245 judgments finding that UK has violated one or another uh, right, ECHR right. But the number of these kind of uh, cases where uh, which go to the European Court of Human Rights has gradually decreased, uh, suggesting that actually this, this kind of principles and this kind of uh, uh, laws are part of the British legislation already, and there is less cases where something needs to be referred higher up to uh, the court. So this is the context and the bigger study, uh, Gemma, can we move on? And the bigger study uh, which we embarked on was around uh, the legitimacy of the European Convention and the European Court of Human Rights in British media coverage. As part of this, what we've done is to carry out thematic analysis following Brown and Clark um, to explore how different topics and different uh, arguments um, have been used in the coverage to either undermine or to support the legitimacy of the convention and the court. And as a step two in this analysis, what we've been interested in is to um, explore different misunderstandings and misrepresentations of the role of the convention vis-a-vis uh, -vis UK and see how these different kind of issues and themes emerge become prominent or disappear over time, with specific reference to um, some of the kind of more high profile court rulings uh, around the question of uh, sovereignty, particularly prominent in the context of uh, Brexit, so before, during and after, and uh, any debates about withdrawal. We're also interested in uh, the role of ECHR in safeguarding media freedom, and this is the bit which we are talking about today. Um, so just to give you an idea of our data, we are using historical data, uh, mapping coverage from 97 to 2022. We've used uh, Nexus to collect uh, articles from six British national newspapers using the keywords we could, which you can see on the slide. And we've come up with 30,500 um, articles. Um, obviously, too big a sample for any sort of meaningful qualitative analysis. So this has been uh, narrowed down. Uh, and we've looked at the sample of roughly 10%, the sample being generated using a random generator. The table on the slide gives you an idea of the numbers and the spread across newspapers and also our final sample, uh, which we've analyzed. Yeah. So um, we've used Envivo. Uh, working with undergraduate and postgraduate students. And uh, I mean, we followed the usual kind of standard process for carrying out thematic analysis, reading, rereading articles to familiarize ourselves with uh, the data, identify codes, ensure consistency, develop the final theoretical framework um, consisting of several broad themes and sub themes. Um, considering that the question which was kind of the overarching and leading the whole study was around the legitimacy and the argument undermining and supporting this legitimacy uh, what you see on the slide is what we've come up with in terms of different um, uh, themes uh, perhaps not surprisingly there was a lot more undermining uh, of the legitimacy both in terms of the range of arguments which were being used by the newspapers but also in terms of the actual quantity um Gemma. yeah so very briefly again just for context what we've discovered is that the newspapers that were the guardian and the times uh what we've discovered is that there was a relatively small number of topics incidents events rulings which dominated this uh, coverage um we've also discovered that 
different newspapers have their own pet projects, which they focus on, for example, prisoners' rights being an issue for the Telegraph, if I'm not mistaken. And analytically, the arguments which we've discovered uh, could be divided into three levels or three dimensions, if you want, uh, in terms of ideas about freedom, rights and sovereignty. So how ECHR plays into the debates about this. Um, the second level was the working of the international system of human rights, where obviously CHR is an important part and discussion around what kind of difference CHR actually makes to individuals, groups and society as a whole. And finally, the outcomes, uh, which is the outcomes, what exactly happens and on, on the ground and how this impacts individual cases. So moving on to the next slide, Gemma, thank you. So what we want to uh, talk about more and Gemma will take over from me now is this one specific category uh, of uh, the coverage which we um, identified which is uh, really about providing a safety net which is done through uh, referring um, or discussing uh, the convention as a route to seek justice and as a source of redress for those who have been uh, wronged. Over to Gemma now. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, basically what we're finding is that there's a lot of criticism of the convention and the court, but when it comes to media freedom, um, not so much. So when it's newspapers who want to actually use the convention and the court to defend their right to freedom of expression, they're very supportive in their coverage. Um, and the court has actually done a great job in protecting media freedom and developing it. Um, so Article 10 is the article that basically guarantees everyone has the right to freedom of expression. Um, but it's important to note that this isn't an absolute right. So Article 10.2 means that it can be limited in certain circumstances. So for example, um, in the interests of national security, for prevention of disorder or crime, or the protection or right, of rights of others. Um, so there are instances in which the right to freedom of expression can be limited. And when it comes to media freedom and judgments from the European Court of Human Rights, since 1980, the UK has been involved in 22 cases involving Article 10. Um, and only a handful of these have been bought by certain publishing houses or journalists. So these are just a few examples. We have Times Newspaper, Observer and Guardian, Financial Times, and then Goodwin, who was himself a journalist. And in these cases, the European Court has often made decisions that has strengthened media freedom. So, for example, whether it's the protection of sources, whether it's been the reform of contempt of court, um, and we've also seen success fees being disproportionate. So success fees are basically an added fee that a solicitor is entitled to if their client's case is successful. Um, so, for example, if a publishing house has to pay out more money, then that's obviously quite dangerous for them, um, especially when we know they're going through a lot of economic distress at this moment in time as well. So I'm just gonna run through very quickly some of the cases that have actually strengthened the protection um, of media freedom. So when it comes to sources, the European Court of Human Rights has been pretty adamant that co the confidentiality of journalist sources is needed to be protected. So, for example, in the case of Goodwin, um, Goodwin was a journalist who was ordered to disclose the identity of his source of information on a company's confidential corporate plan. Um, so the case went to the House of Lords. They said, you have to tell us who your source is. It then got taken to the European Court of Human Rights, who then turned around and said, no, that's not correct. A journalist's source is important to remain hidden. Um, so, for example, when it comes to whistleblowing, for example, um, we don't usually find out who the source is. And that's why, you know, investigative journalism is successful, because they are allowed to have these confidential sources. Again, the case of Financial Times against the UK went on to further emphasize the importance of protecting sources. So this is another case about an anonymous source leaking a document about a possible company takeover. Um, and then finally, we also have Big Brother Watch and others. So this was a case bought by four different groups. I think it was Big Brother Watch, Open Rights Group, English Pen, and another individual. 
Um, and this case came following the Edward Snowden revelations, um, which exposed the exploitation of surveillance and intelligence sharing programs in the US and the UK. Um, and again, the European Court of Human Rights emphasized that you know, surveillance, um, if you're going to surveil sources, um, that can be in con contradiction with Article 10, unless it's justified by an overriding requi requirement in the public interest. So again, this is the uh, example of the European Court of Human Rights offering the utmost protection for media freedom in the United Kingdom. Gemma, you have five more minutes. Thank yeah. you. No problem. Um, and then we also have the issue of prior restraint. So one of the most famous cases is the Observer and Guardian v the, against the UK, um, which is more commonly known as the Spycatcher case. So in this case, um, Spycatcher was a controversial memoir that was written by a senior intelligence officer. Um, and in the book, he revealed undemocratic and unlawful activities by MI5 agents. Um, injunctions were issued against the Observer and the Guardian but they were dropped in October 1988, once the book had been published in other countries. Um, so it was published, for example, in the US as early as July 1987, so over a year before. Um, but the newspapers went on to challenge the injunctions, um, which had prevented publication prior to that October 1988 date when the injunction was dropped. So the case once again reached the European Court of Human Rights, um, where it was argued that prior restraint placed um, on media outlets presents grave risks to freedom of expression, especially when it comes to news stories, because as we know, news is a perishable commodity. Um, so it's really important to get stories out, you know, as and when they're happening. Um, so again, the court basically said um, prior restraint in this instance should not have been used. Um, and then the second case was the Sunday Times against the UK um, and the Sunday Times had published information related to pending civil proceedings between the manufacturer of the drug thalidomide. Um, so thalidomide had been found to cause severe birth defects and there was you know, civil action going on um, from the affected families of the drug. So the Attorney General attempted to obtain an injunction um, against publication of the article in the Sunday Times on the grounds that it would constitute contempt of court. Um, the House of Lords upheld this, but the European Court again disagreed with them and said that this shouldn't have been the case because there was an outweighing need in the public interest for this information to be published. And then this in turn led to reform of contempt of court laws um, and in particular the Contempt of Court Act 1981 where the former At Attorney General Dominic Grieve in a speech that he gave basically said it was introduced as a liberalising measure um, designed to harmonise our law with the court's judgment. And then finally as mentioned earlier about success fees um, so the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Mirror Group newspapers against the UK um, said that the success fees were disproportionate that the Mirror had to pay to Naomi Campbell. So in this case, the Mirror had published a article on Naomi Campbell detailing her drug treatment that she was undergoing while she was in rehab. It was found that there was an invasion of privacy. So, you know, the European Court said you did still invade their pri her privacy, um, but the fees that you were ordered to pay were disproportionate um, and could potentially have a chilling effect as well on journalism moving forward. And then this is really what's interesting to us is that after looking at our preliminary findings, we usually see the European Court of Human Rights sort of being bashed in um, the judgments that it passes down. But in all of these cases, um, it's actually been praised by the publications. So the Times, for example, said it was a good judgment from the Strasbourg Court on the case of Goodwin. Um, it was a common sense judgment as well. Um, the Guardian also supported it too, um, which perhaps isn't as surprising because preliminary foundings has found the Guardian to be um, a bit more supportive of the court and convention than the Times. And then just another example on Spycatcher as well. Um, yesterday, Spycatcher judgments by the European Court of Human Rights shows that it agrees with us. Um, once more, Strasbourg has come to the rescue and another shackle on free speech in the UK looks set to be lifted. 
So just to sum up, what we have witnessed from our preliminary research is that there's hostility from some sectors of the press towards human rights and the court and the convention. Um, but despite this, publishing houses and journalists have used the court when they feel their Article 10 right has been violated. So they have taken cases there um, and they've been successful as well in the majority of their claims and also seen the laws reformed towards liberalisation of media law. Um, so in these cases where the judgments go in their favour, what we then see is support of the court and convention, um, which is really contradictory to what we see perhaps in their overall day-to-day -day reporting of um, the court and convention. So I'll end it.